All right, Sean Stevenson, you and I have both been hooked on processed food before. That was a part of our life. And we want to offer up some strategies to get off of processed food. So we're going to do a little back and forth here. Matt, and I'll let you uh, take the privilege of, of leading off. You're the guest. Awesome. Yes. To say I was addicted to processed food is an understatement. There's this phenomenon in my neighborhood, living in the inner city, of the bomb pop man or the ice cream man. And he'd be ringing this bell. It's just like the Pied Piper. Kids would be coming out of everywhere, running over to the bomb pop truck. And it had all these tasty treats, all these pictures of these different foods. And it's all in the form of these kind of frozen treats. And so, yes, they're absolutely delicious. And this phenomenon is still existing, whether it's a bomb pop truck or whether it's just going to our grocery store. And one of my strategies is upgrading some of the things that we love, that we know, like, and trust as far as food experiences. Kids love frozen treats. Let's lean into that, but let's upgrade the ingredients because food isn't just food, it's information. And so one of my favorite foods, and I identified about 40 of the most science-backed foods for improving metabolic health, sleep quality, mental health in my new book, The Eat Smarter Family Cookbook. One of those foods is dark cherries. And today's video is sponsored by Seed. If you're worried about your gut microbiome, you're trying to make some changes, but ultimately, if you're trying to add carbohydrates back into your diet after doing low carb for a long time, very important you take care of your microbiome. So that link down below saves you 25% off of Seed's daily symbiotic which has a prebiotic and a probiotic in one capsule. So a capsule inside of a capsule. Super interesting technology. Very, very cool to check out. So they also fund a lot of microbiome research. So they put their money where their mouth is. A lot of the proceeds go back into research because we're trying to understand what these little microbes in our gut do and how important they are. So anyhow, it makes a big difference, made a big difference for me. I don't usually recommend probiotics because a lot of them are garbage, but this one's definitely worth a shot. So that link down below is in the top line of the description for seed. A really remarkable study published in the Journal of Food Sciences found that these cherry anthocyanins have the potential to shrink fat cells, which is crazy. But more interestingly, these dark cherries are one of the most dense sources of naturally occurring melatonin. All right, so there's this kind of glorified sleep hormone found in this food. We've got a couple of studies also looking at cherry juice being used to help improve sleep quality, but we can get a little bit too far into the sugar with that, you know, being a little bit more mindful. But do we just eat the cherries or make our kids eat cherries all the time? Or can we turn this into a delicious flavor experience? So. One of my favorite things to do with my kids, and kids love this, is making cherry frozen yogurt pops. They're super easy to make. Just need a little uh, popsicle mold that you can put in the freezer. You guys can hang out together, have a good time, make these delicious treats. And whenever they want one, they can go right over to the freezer and grab a cherry frozen yogurt pop. So one of my biggest strategies and recommendations for helping to shift away from ultra processed foods is leaning into, rather than running away from, lean into the things that we know, like, and love in the ultra processed form and upgrade the ingredients to make some similar meals. That's a perfect one, man, because that little like, that experience is everything. And we do the same kind of thing, right? It's like sometimes we'll take, uh, you know, like lemonade that's made with stevia and we'll just make it into a little pop rather than, you know, it's, it's so simple. Yeah. And as far as the kids and as far as the family's concerned, like I can grab these things. There's five calories in them, right? It's amazing. Like it's awesome. And I'm not feeling like I'm missing anything. Uh, another interesting strategy that I've had now, people don't always know this about me too, but I was, you know, very overweight before Jack in the box was my jam, milkshakes and tacos, like you name it. That was the main thing. But this one's a little bit more nuanced with things I've learned in the biochemistry world, and that's that sugar affects one area of our brain, sweet things, and fats affect another area of our brain. And a lot of the hyperpalatable, like ultra processed foods are combining these things, like in copious amounts. It's not bad to combine some fats and carbs. Like obviously humans have been doing it for thousands of years. But when you have copious amounts combined together along with ridiculously calorically dense foods, it's a problem. So although some people might say, well, you're still going to eat processed foods. What I tell people is step one, if you can't avoid the processed foods, try to at least eliminate the processed foods that are combining the fats and carbs. That's a great step because you're not lighting up both regions of your brain. So the addictive power of those processed foods shrinks a little bit. 
So yeah, you look at a, take a processed food for instance. Okay, let's just pick on Doritos for a second. High amount of carbohydrates in a very processed form that's relatively high glycemic along with a high amount of fat. Then you look at a Snickers bar, same kind of thing, high sugar and high fat. So it's just like ultra just delicious and your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. You say, okay, you know what? That's cool. If I have to go for a processed food item, let me at least sort of keep them separate. Let me just have something that's maybe a, a lower fat, higher carb, or maybe a higher fat, lower carb option. It's not the best case scenario, but it is a step in the right direction, not because it's literally saving everything, but because you'll notice the addiction is a little bit less. Mm, I love this so much. And you must have known already, which you probably do, we have Snicker Bites that stay in the freezer in the new cookbook ah, as nice. well. You know, just again, leaning into the higher quality ingredient aspect as well. And another piece of this is creating a microculture that makes healthy choices automatic. Mm. We've got some sound data on this, by the way. So some researchers at Harvard for years were tracking family eating behaviors and food choices. And what I mean by that is they're looking at how often families are eating together. And they found that families that eat together on a consistent basis consumed significantly higher amounts of fruits and vegetables and by nature, significantly higher amounts of essential nutrients that help to prevent diseases in those family members. And they consumed significantly less ultra processed foods, namely chips and soda, as well as some of those artificial ingredients and one of these kind of nefarious fats in particular in ultra processed food, trans fats. And so it was really interesting to see that. And that led me into a journey of even creating this in the first place, this new cookbook was because of this study I'm about to share with you. Because working with people for so many years, I know that people want change, they wanna get different results, but a lot of times we don't wanna change that much to get them. We're very comfortable. Even if we're not happy where we are, we tend to develop comfort because our brains are always looking for automation. And so knowing that we don't wanna turn our world upside down to get certain results, I was always looking for what is the minimum effective dose. And so through that lens of like, okay, so these families eating together had this outcome, how many times do we have to do it? And a study published in the journal Pediatrics, looking specifically at children's eating behaviors, found that when families ate together with, those, with their children, just three meals a week, three or more, but three was that minimal effective dose, there was a significantly reduced incidence of developing obesity in those children and reduced incidence of developing disordered eating when they ate with their families three meals or more per week. And to couple with that, and this really speaks to what about the environment? What about, what if you don't have resources? What if you don't have access to healthy foods? This is a story from where I come from, living in a low income environment, living in poverty here in the United States. And I make that distinction because in the, in the United States, if you're living in poverty, you still probably have a TV. We still had a, a Nintendo. We got it later than everybody, maybe a year later, but we still had some of these things. We had a car from time to time. We did take public transportation a lot, but my mom would get cars from this place called OK Junk Cars. It was on Manchester and Maplewood uh, in Missouri. And so you still have access to different things versus some places in the world, they're living on less than $5 a day as a family. And so, but living in poverty in the United States, we were getting food from charities, uh, we were, my mom was, she'd sell her blood as often as she can to get food. She worked overnight at a convenience store and she was robbed on one of those occasions and stabbed multiple times. Like it's a very volatile environment that we're living in. And so the question is, does this apply when we don't have a lot of money? And this particular study was looking at minority children who would generally be in the construct of a low income environment like I come from. And the researchers found that when these kids were able to eat with their families, no matter what meal it was, by the way, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, four meals a week, those children consumed significantly higher amounts of fruits and vegetables. They found five servings of fruits and vegetables every day, five days out of the week, for five days out of the seven day week. And here's the other part, significantly less ultra processed foods. So if we're looking at how do we move away from eating as many ultra processed foods, it's not just the food, it's the culture as well. How we're eating, who we're eating with, because there's modeling behavior taking place, there's naturally a subconscious planning involved. If we know that we're eating dinner as a family, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and maybe brunch on Sunday, we're gonna have it in our subconscious, like, okay, what are we eating? We know we're eating family dinner, dinner on Wednesday, what are we having? So we're gonna have a tendency to have more full, whole foods incorporated, but even if it's not, this just happened recently 
my wife got caught in some LA traffic. She was at some kind of appointment and she had planned on coming home to cook. And it was like 6.30, my son had school in the morning, my youngest son, my oldest son, we knew that we were having family dinner. And I was like, okay, what are we gonna do? And I used DoorDash. I DoorDash that bad boy, got a high quality meal, but we sat down and ate together. Still stuck to the script. We had a great time, a lot of laughs, but I got to check in with my family, with my sons. and because a lot of our communication is nonverbal. So I got to see you know, where they're at, how they're communicating, their energy. And also we have this practice of gratitude before we eat, just asking them, each of us go around and share three things that we're grateful for. And so you can create family rituals, of course, around the table, but eating together is one of those force multipliers. It's one of those things that affects so much, whether it's a physical health thing or psychological for our kids because one of the things being a parent of my two oldest are adults. My oldest son is still in, in the house. He's 23. He's in his last semester of college. So I believe I believe he's about to move. And my youngest son is 12. But seeing how it's so important to catch the monster while it's small, if they're dealing with something, to be able to identify it while it's small before it blows up into something big. And a lot of times they'll give you that feedback. But of course, kids have their moods, they have their own lives outside of our doors. So we have to create a condition. The dinner table is really a unifier to be able to be together, to feel, to, to emit this feeling of presence, for them to feel seen. Also for us to develop empathy and compassion. One of our other exercises we did for quite some time was go through everybody share something we failed at today. And as crazy as it sounds, they don't see me as failing at stuff. You know, like they see dad is sometimes a superhero, like nothing could stop me or nothing could hurt me. It can be further from the truth. But for me to share that, it really helped to humanize me. And I see that my boys have a lot more compassion for me that they didn't have previously, right? And so that's really another superpower for helping to move away, away from ultra processed food. The mission for everybody, three meals a week. That's my recommendation based on the data and also practicality. Pick whatever days those are, the secret though is to schedule it. Put it on your calendar, whatever calendar you use, your Google calendar, physical calendar, whatever it is, make it real, write it down. We got all these other things that are less important than our families that are on our schedule. Pick those days, write them down, three meals a week can dramatically help to shift how many ultra processed foods your family's eating versus real whole foods. And that, that can work even if you're living by yourself or you're just a couple. I mean, it's just like still putting it down. Like it's almost easier for someone that's living by themselves to just go out to eat because it, it's not that expensive when you're by yourself and you can just go roll through the drive through whatever. Uh, so it's like, hey, you can still put it down for yourself too. And like with that, there's a, a great one that I've found with anybody and it works really well just as an individual, but it also works really well with the family and it's a two part equation. Have a protein appetizer. now. If you're solo, you're flying solo, it's really easy. What I typically do is say, hey, I will have a little bit of chicken or a protein shake or something before I go into any kind of meal. If I'm gonna go out to eat or if I'm gonna go grocery shopping, I typically have a protein shake or some kind of protein before I head into the grocery store so that I am satiated and do not put that stuff in my environment in the first place. Because if it's in my environment, I am human and I will probably find it somehow. And I just don't really want that in my environment. So I have a protein appetizer before I even shop. But then if I'm out to dinner. Now, I mean, again, cost is gonna come into play here. So it's not everyone's gonna say, I'm gonna spend $17 on a protein appetizer. But if you're sitting down at home, like have a little bit of chicken or a little bit of shrimp at the table. And like, while you guys are finishing up your meal or you're finishing up cooking the meal, maybe you can sit down and just munch on a little protein before the food actually comes out on the table. Maybe like get creative with the appetizers. And that does a couple of things. It makes it so you don't overindulge on food in the first place, but more importantly, it's making it so that you're conscious of these decisions. Now with that, the other piece of the equation is if you're sitting down at home, exactly like you said, having the conversations while you are eating, is A, doing something for obviously your mind, but it's also slowing down how much you eat. So let's say step one is you don't know how to get off processed food and the family is eating processed food all together at the table. Okay, have some conversations while you're eating so that you are able to slow down the rate at which you eat 
and you're able to make better conscious decisions and you're gonna have a better ghrelin response, better leptin response because you're eating slower. And then it literally does become easier to get off of those foods because if you liken it to the same situation as let's just say a street drug, just to make it simple, if you were to sit down and consume a ridiculous amount of a street drug in one sitting, it's gonna cause a huge problem and make you very addicted. But if it was a smaller amount, it would still be bad, but the level of tolerance and addiction would arguably be less. So the amount you ingest when you come down to processed foods, if you can just have a conversation and ultimately limit your ingestion a little bit more, it does make a difference. And that's one of the ways that I was able to kind of get off fast food. So I was like, hey, like, I'm gonna eat this slower because with fast food in particular, it's so delicious tasting, you wanna inhale it. And when you inhale it, it's almost like taking a pill. I mean, you're just taking all this stuff in. So the first conscious decision I made was, I'm just gonna eat this slower and I'm actually gonna savor every bite of it. And next thing you know, I went from four tacos down to two <laughs> tacos because they're still two for 99 cents. So I would just spend you know, $1 and get two tacos because I wasn't getting through all four. Is it Jack in the Box the most bleeding, like, we're gonna mess you up name too? I mean, Jack in the Box <laughs> literally is like a gift that scares the out of you. Yeah, you know exactly what I mean? What it it's is. like, yeah, it's horrible. So crazy. But shout out to the two for 99 cent tacos. I've been there a time or 10 myself. And, you know, you just mentioned something really remarkable too that we don't think about. And I shared this really cool study in the book looking at how the act of chewing itself functions as a stress reducer. And this makes sense, lo sense logically because, you know, through our evolution, when we happen upon food, because a lot of our energy is being expended in hunting and gathering and trying to procure food. And a lot of days, this was uncertain how it would come about. And so being able to finally chew on that food is going to help reduce stress. Now, we also have this really remarkable ability to, as humans, extract more or less from the food that we're eating as far as assimilation based on how we're chewing. The process of chewing is an initiation, like that first interaction of something really special, but also your, your body's on high alert when you put something into your mouth because you're taking something from the external environment and putting it in your body. This could mean something kills you or heals you potentially through our evolution. And so your immune system's gonna be top, you know, front line. And also you get an opportunity to denote safety when you're chewing on that food as well. And you're mixing it with your data. You know, your DNA is in your saliva, right? If people like, was it Maury Provich? So when they do the DNA test, you're not the father. They're taking a swab from your mouth. Like your DNA is getting encoded and kind of mixing with that food, let alone the enzymes that we're producing. It's like the first step in digestion. And so it's really special if we take the time and it, we're going to inherently, the bottom line is the data indicates we're improving assimilation, digestion, elimination of metabolic waste when we slow down and we chew well. And that's one of the side effects we see, again, affirmed by data when we eat with other people on a consistent basis we tend to be more satisfied from our meals. Now this speaks to also, there's a big switch over that's happening with our nervous system. And so most of us in our day-to-day -day lives, we're just living in that fight or flight, that sympathetic dominance. You know, there's always something, you know, our ancestors had time, you know, to kind of go in and out of that. Whereas today we're all, we've always got some psychological thing. Our to-do lists are endless. We knock five things off, it's replaced by 10. I've become more content knowing that, you know, even on my last day, my inbox is gonna be full. I'm gonna have a list of, you know, 20 things to do. And that's just how it is, especially today. And so being able to switch over from that sympathetic fight or flight into the parasympathetic, and the nickname of that one is quote, rest and digest. Digest being the key word here. This is what we see when we're sitting down and eating with people that we care about, namely through the lens of oxytocin. Right, so oxytocin gets this nickname as the cuddle hormone or the love hormone, but it denotes and, and creates, establishes bonding between humans. And oxytocin has been found to essentially neutralize the activity of cortisol. And not to villainize cortisol, by the way, we need all of these things, but sometimes we're just, again, we're just pumping out this stress state. And so eating with people that we care about switches over that nervous system to the parasympathetic. And so also you said something so important too, this is inclusive, whether you're living with your family right now or not, or whatever your family blueprint looks like, friends are included in this as well. You know, friends, family, coworkers, just with people, if you can, to the best of your ability, people that you care about. And so 
a study that was published in Nutrition Journal found that when we eat in isolation on a regular basis, we tend to have a poor diet quality and we tend to be less satisfied with the food that we're eating, all right? We tend to eat more and we tend to eat worse food, all right? And we know this. Oftentimes today, we're eating in isolation in front of a screen. Mind-numbing media, we're not even paying attention to that food experience. Not to villainize that, by the way, again, I've been known to you know, put on, I don't know, random Conan O'Brien clips from his show back in the day or whatever it might be while eating a meal. And that's all fun and, fun and good. And even getting together, watching the game together or watching a movie or show together, that's cool. But we need this real FaceTime. It does something really remarkable for our assimilation, for our food choices. And one other piece here to add to it and another tip for helping to move away from our rampant consumption of ultra processed food, which according to the BMJ, the average adult in the United States diet is now 60% ultra processed food. And according to the Journal of the American Medical Association, upwards right now, it's at 67% plus of the average US child's diet is ultra processed food. All right, that was looking at from 1999 to 2018, it has gone up precipitously. How do we shift this? Another key here is we're talking about the microculture, right? Controlling the controllables. You mentioned this as well leading into this, which is like not bringing it in the, into the house in the first place. But that's easier said than done. If you're going into the grocery store, like you said, and you're a little bit hungry, you're gonna end up with stuff in your cart that might not have gotten there in the first place. But another part of this is the kitchen culture itself, having the energy and the intention to create healthier meals on a regular basis, that in and of itself can be a tremendous task today. Again, because we got so much going on. And this really interesting study was done at off, with office workers at IBM. So people working in the tech industry. And they found that regardless of how stressed work was, how stressful their work life was, if they were able to eat dinner with their family on a consistent basis, stress stayed negligible, it kind of helped them to metabolize stress and their work morale stayed high. Productivity is going to stay high. Everything is fine. Like there's something that neutralizes the stress at work. But as soon as work obligations cut into their ability to eat with their families on a regular basis, stress goes up. Work output goes down. Work, most importantly, job satisfaction goes down. And so where do we get the energy? to actually, because sometimes we don't want it. We just want to unplug and just like throw a show on and do something mindless. How do we have the energy to sit down? Because here's the crazy thing. When people do this on a regular basis, they're going to find that their energy starts to, starts to increase when they're eating with their family on a regular basis on spots when they normally would feel drained. Part of this is creating a kitchen culture for yourself to create the vibe that you feel good about so you can prepare more healthy meals. Because part of that is like coming into a place and then like maybe you, you know, you're, you're trying to dig deep and have the energy to prepare a healthy meal. What if you can create an energizing environment that you love, that you're excited about? Maybe this is for my wife. Like she just made food yesterday and she put on Real Housewives or something. I don't know. One of these shows that she, I'm not going to watch with her. So she's got that plan, right? And she's preparing a meal. She's like laughing, whatever, like. That's the environment that she wanted to prepare food in. And she volunteered. Like she wanted to step away and go do that. She didn't have to. Usually on Sundays, she doesn't cook, but she wanted to. And maybe it's just because she wanted to catch up on this show. Or you could throw, I'm a morning, I'm a morning music kitchen guy. I'm in, the, I'm in the morning, I'm making my son's breakfast, making my wife's coffee, got the music going. You know, we're singing, we're dancing around sometimes. Like it's a vibe I create that I like. I look forward to it. You know, after I finish, you know, I go on a morning walk, I come in, Alexa, connect to my iPhone and we're going to get it popping in the kitchen and get a certain energy going. So create an environment, a kitchen environment that feels good, that maybe there's people invited into it. You know, maybe your kids are helping, maybe you're a significant other, maybe you don't want anybody. This is your territory. Know thyself, create an environment that you like to step into to prepare healthier meals. Last piece is if you can stack the meals as well. I'm a huge fan of making more than enough. So you gotta do it less often, you know? So making a nice big batch of something, whether it's grass, slow cooker grass-fed chili is one of our favorite recipes. We, I just had that yesterday. Or as we talked about before, 
utilizing sweet potatoes and making sweet potato protein pancakes, making a big batch. Let's eat some, enjoy these sweet potato pancakes right now, freeze up the rest so my son can have them in the morning. I could have some, maybe with a side of fruit and just make the process easier. So my wife doesn't have to make him breakfast in the morning or I don't have to make him breakfast every day because we made a big batch at one time. I love that, man. And like echoing the sentiments on breakfast, everything that you said about people in isolation making poor decisions. If you were to look at the literature, you find that a lot of times people eat these light on the go breakfasts and they opt for more processed breakfasts a lot of the times. And when you start connecting the dots, you realize, oh, people are heading out the door, they're on their way to work, they're on their way to school, and they are in isolation. And they say, I'm just gonna grab a, uh, you know, a granola bar, or I'm just gonna grab something light, right? Now, we might know that that light meal is not so light when it comes down to the caloric density of it, when it comes down to how devoid of nutrients it is. It's dark. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad hole to end up in, right? And like even, even like, for example, like you go to a, you know, like McDonald's, you're like, I'm gonna get something light, and I'm gonna have a fruit and yogurt parfait for McDonald's or something like, you know, riddled with sugar. It's not, and it's, it's not a real wholesome yogurt and fruit, right? Make that at home. But I guess my point in saying this is that the more that we can start to say, hey, I'm gonna make a conscious effort to have breakfast be a centerpiece in my family or even for myself. Take time for yourself and have a bigger, more voluptuous breakfast, even though it seems to go against the grain of everything that society is doing. Because even the most overweight people are still like, I don't understand, I barely eat anything for breakfast. Well, a lot of times that's the problem because the studies are very, very clear when they demonstrate that the smaller the breakfast, the more the calories get skewed towards the end of the day, which isn't exactly good for a number of things, metabolically, blood sugar modulation, all of that, but also mentally. Think about this. You make a light decision in the morning. So you say, I'm just going to have that granola bar on the road, you know, on the way out. Well, then you're hungry later in the day. You're hungry when you're mentally exhausted. So then what do you do? Well, then you come home and you raid the pantry because you're mentally drained and you're hungry. Two terrible combinations, right? And then also that ends up reflecting in what you might cook for the family or what you might indulge in, right? And it's like, if you can say, hey, you know what? I am gonna carve out 10 minutes. Breakfast is an easy meal to make. It doesn't take long to make eggs. It doesn't take long to do steak and eggs or some chicken and some eggs and some pancakes, like stuff in your book, you know, really quick stuff. And then you're getting a good bolus of calories in the morning. And I promise people that if you do that, you will eat less throughout the rest of the day. You will because you're satiated. And if you keep it protein focused, then you're definitely going to be satiated throughout the rest of the day. And it's also a great time to kind of powwow with the family too, if that's your thing. Be like, everyone's busy. We can't do breakfast. Then you get up 10 minutes earlier and make it a priority because that feel good response and those hormones that are going to be circulating are going to make everyone's day feel better and make them make better decisions too. Absolutely. That's so good. And by the way, when you said this is really affirmed in, in the science now, this is experiential for a lot of people, but so this was published in the International Journal of Obesity and they actually did this for breakfast. They had test subjects to consume a higher protein breakfast or a high carbohydrate breakfast. So this was eggs versus bagels, all right? Same amount of calories, by the way. And they did have all the test subjects to reduce their caloric intake overall for the day and they monitored everything. And so, after compiling the data, even though the test subjects were eating the same amount of calories, that breakfast meal made a really remarkable change on what their metabolism was doing. And this was a multi-month study. At the end of the study, the test subjects who ate the eggs for breakfast lost over 60% more in their BMI. They lost over 50% more weight. They lost about 16% more actual belly fat and other really remarkable bio biomarkers were improved. Again, same caloric intake, but there was something remarkable about that choice for breakfast. So in particular, really leaning into making sure we're getting some high quality protein, but also this is a real food versus processed food equation as well, you know, but not to villainize bagels. Bagels have their place. There might be a hole in their game, but you know, that's one option, but that is the, that is the normal option in our society today. It is very carbohydrate dominant. I knew I grew up eating pop tarts for breakfast, all manner of breakfast cereals, all manner of, you know, different toasts and things like things like that, donuts, the list goes on and on. But I actually, my friend lived by the Hostess factory or outlet, all right? So we go to the Hostess factory and get, you know, four honey buns for a dollar, like it's crazy. 
And these are the foods that we're eating starting our day. And guess what? Of course, I'm going to be ravenous through the day. Of course, I'm going to eat all these ultra processed fruit foods through the day. I remember in high school, I was just constantly eating, just constantly eating. And that's a, it, that should be a symptom or an identifiable symptom that we're not getting what our, what our DNA, what our genes are really looking for to ignite the activity of our satiety hormones, leptin and GLP-1 and all these different things. It isn't just one thing, by the way. There's this like army that creates this feeling of satiety, adiponectin. But the data indicates that's gonna be coming from real food, nutrient-dense real foods. There's not gonna be a lot of data, if any, on eating Pop-Tarts and feeling satisfied. Not to villainize Pop-Tarts, because again, maybe just the act of eating that Pop-Tart might bring you some kind of nostalgia, right? But we need to be mindful of, if that is making up the majority of my diet, which that was for me, I know that, I know what this is like, because 90%, I'm not exaggerating in the slightest, 90% of my diet was ultra processed foods, mainly from fast food. And so beginning to shift that ratio, that's, you know, my last tip here is, we know that 60% of the average adults diet in the United States is ultra processed food. We know that almost 70% of our children's diet in the United States is now ultra processed foods. Let's strive to simply shift the ratio. Instead of 70, 30 ultra processed to minimally processed or unprocessed, let's go 70 minimally processed whole foods, 30% ultra processed foods. Let's just strive for that, strive for that ratio and you can see a dramatic improvement in your metabolic health, in your sleep quality, in your energy. Not to completely banish or dismiss the fact that honey buns exist or you know donuts exist. Those are flavor experiences that exist in our world today. And here's the cool thing, we can upgrade those experiences. And I'm a huge fan of that as we started off with, when it comes to frozen treats, let's upgrade that. These cherry frozen yogurt pops, pancakes, Sweet potato pancakes is another one of our favorite recipes from the book. Snicker bites using real whole food ingredients, but it's not gonna sit on the store shelf. You gotta keep it in the freezer. When you want that tasty treat, you go grab it out of the freezer. We've got these delicious uh, superfood bark. We've got these cashew butter planets. They're so delicious. They're like these ice cream balls. The list goes on and on. We can upgrade many of our favorite desserts and dishes. And you know, for me right now, I'm very, bullish on honey right now very bullish on honey because as one of the studies that i shared in the book and there's over 250 scientific references in a cookbook by the way which has never been done but it's in a way that's entertaining and fun and engaging but also the science is there it's not just like i'm saying this because it sounds good but honey to call it a mere sweetener is a little disrespectful no we got trehalose we got all that good stuff in there man <laughs> it's it's crazy like if we're looking at honey versus cane sugar, organic cane sugar, it's like, it's not a, it's in a completely different universe. The antioxidant content, the enzymes, and not to mention, here's something really interesting. So one of the studies that I shared in the book was people midterm, mid to long term, eating honey as their sweetener actually had improvements in their fasting blood sugar. Okay, so again, this is a sweetener that can improve fasting blood sugar. That's not normal. Also improving blood fats, the blood lipids, and reducing the risk overall of cardiovascular disease. Again, published peer-reviewed data. But even more so, it's the remarkable benefits that honey seems to have on our brain. It's one of the foods that's been identified that could potentially reduce neuroinflammation, which is downstream, we talked about this in another conversation, the researchers at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine found that inflammation in the brain can downstream create more belly fat and insulin resistance, which then creates more inflammation in the brain. Honey is one of these foods that helps to reduce inflammation in the body. And so we're not taking away the sweet enjoyment. We're not taking away our favorite desserts. We're not taking away our favorite you know, foods, our meals, you know, whether that's a burger or whether that's our favorite casserole. Like we can bring to the table, literally, real food ingredients that taste as good or better in those ultra processed versions. But the secret, which shouldn't be a secret, is that we need to do this together. Yeah. We need to become more kitchen literate. We need to become more food literate. And for not just ourselves, but to encourage this and support this in our extended family as well, because that's how we create a movement.
Absolutely, man. And the last one that I will end with is talking about the snacking side of things. And you took the words out of my mouth with honey, but in general regard, there's just too much demonization of fruit as a whole. Grab fruit. And I spent so many years of my life being afraid of fruit and I have to fall on the sword there, right? I would think fructose, liver fat, you know, fructose, visceral fat, fatty liver, all this. Oh, fructose, no, it's the worst. And just to get, you know, biochemical for one second, yes, fructose can convert into, you know, it's gonna store as triglycerides a little bit faster in that region if you go overboard on it. But fructose is an entirely different ball game. Fructose also does not spike insulin. So you're going to have less of that insulinogenic response that is going to be detrimental for lipolysis. So in a lot of ways, if you don't go overboard, albeit you'd have to have quite a bit to go overboard. And most people aren't going overboard. The only way they'd really be going overboard with fructose is if they're having high fructose corn syrup and they're having it in a concentrated processed amount. And the whole idea here is getting away from that. Grab the kiwi, grab the apple, grab the grapes, even though they're quote unquote sugar bombs, as some people will call them. I promise you, if you opt for that as your snack, things will fall into place. Now, I know a lot of people can you know, consume an apple and still be hungry after an apple, and that's fine, but you could literally have an apple and a kiwi and some blackberries and some raspberries and probably end up with less calories than you would in a Snickers bar, right? So if you're really worried about calories, then it's a moot point. But if you want something fresh and you want something real, we need to stop demonizing the natural sugars that are occurring out there. And again, if it makes you feel good and it makes us that you can be more active, the carbohydrate equation is a moot point because you're gonna feel good, you're gonna move more. And we have to start somewhere because if you're never able to pattern interrupt, you're gonna be eating the same things, feeling the same way and having the same inactive lifestyle. You know, what is your pattern interrupt going to be? And I guess that's the ultimate tip is pick one pattern interrupt and go all the way with it. If fruit is going to be your pattern interrupt where I'm going to ditch all the snacks and I'm going to take a week and only eat fruit for snacks, watch how your energy level is and see how your decision making processes are the rest of the day. And the same thing goes for honey too. Like, hey, you like sugar in your coffee? All right, I'm not going to ask you to use stevia if you don't like stevia, if you think it's got a weird taste, but I am going to ask you to try honey because 10 grams of sugar from honey is not the same as 10 grams of sugar from that packet. And the trehalose, which is the sugar you talk about that seems to have that anti-inflammatory and sort of a uh, glucose modulating effect, that's real deal. That is the real deal. And if you make those simple swaps, it'll elevate things because it's better on the palate, but it's also going to probably change how you feel in a matter of days. Mm. Love it. Awesome. So, so Sean, man, where can everyone find your book and where else can we find you? You can pick it up anywhere that books are sold. It's called the Eat Smarter Family Cookbook. And this includes online retailers, Barnes and Noble, your local bookstore. And of course, Amazon is an option as well. They actually just lower the price by about 20% for folks popping over to Amazon to get a copy of the book. And it's recently a USA Today national bestseller. It's my second one in a row. I'm very grateful. It was the number one new release cookbook in the United States. Something good about it. There's something really special about it. And what I'm seeing mainly out there on the on the interwebs and social media as people have taken pictures with their recipes, a lot of them have their kids involved. And that is the whole reason that I did this, to really help families to come together under something that is so important to us as a species. Like so many of our special moments involve food. And so giving our kids this very valuable gift of being able to prepare meals for themselves, which another crazy study that I shared in the book is looking at how our most recent generations, less and less kids actually know how to prepare even one meal for themselves. And so by nature, what's going to happen, of course, is we're going to naturally eat more ultra processed foods when we don't know how to make meals for ourselves. So equipping our kids with this really powerful uh, information and also delicious food and doing this together, that's what it's really all about. So people can pick it up anywhere that books are sold and they can find me um, at themodelhealthshow.com. My show is called The Model Health Show and they can find that anywhere they listen to their podcasts. And we do master classes on every subject matter that you can imagine and also have on the very best people in their respective fields as well, like yourself, of course, and talking about metabolic health. And uh, it's, it's an incredible resource. We've been doing this for over 10 years. And so we've been in the game for a long time. And it's really the secret ingredient in that is vitamin C, care. <laughs> <laughs> we care a lot and just helping people so that when they push play, they're going to get a definitive guide on whatever they're looking for. So if it's 
working to improve you know, insulin resistance, whether it's uh, helping to improve their mental health, whatever the case might be, we've got the very best people in the world to learn from. It's all free, just gotta click play. Heck so yeah, it's man. called the Model Health Show. Right on. Well, as always, keep it locked in here in the channel and see you tomorrow. Awesome. Right on.